start the recording. Um, welcome, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, more appropriately. Uh, welcome to our guests from Shoulder to Shoulder. We're so grateful for you to be joining us and for all of you who have taken time over your lunch hour uh, to join us today. Um, uh, it's my honor to introduce to you the Shoulder to Shoulder campaign and as well as um, those who are here uh, to, to represent that campaign. I, I think that it will be exciting for you to hear about it for those of you who it's new. They have been in partnership with us um, for quite some time, um, even been to the Tri-Faith Commons. Uh, so uh, I have had the good pleasure of doing um, some training with them and am so grateful for um, your willingness to, to spend some time educating us about your work today and for us to dream together about how we can continue to deepen our partnership moving forward. Um, I, uh, I had sent a little note out to Rabbi Azriel. Did you get that, Rabbi? Um, I was wondering if perhaps since you're with us today, you might want to ground us um, with an opening prayer. I didn't see the note, and so just give me a, a minute. Our God, God of our fathers and mothers and God of our children, as we begin this conversation, please spread over us a shelter of peace, tranquility, and the ability of hearing each other. Amen. Thank you. He always gets that right, doesn't he? <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so I, I think um, instead of me fumbling over uh, reading to you some kind of introduction, I always welcome the idea, the uh, concept of letting those speak about themselves um, to, to tell us your story. So Catherine, we'll start with you. And I was wondering if you could start by telling us what calls you uh, to the work of Shoulder to Shoulder and um, a bit about your role. Sure, thank you so much for, for having us here today. And it's good to see all of these faces. Um, we're excited to, to be with you and have been so grateful to partner with TriFaith um, over the last many years, in fact. Um, so as, as Wendy said, my name is Catherine Orsborn. Um, I'm the executive director of, of Shoulder to Shoulder, and I've been with the organization for just about seven years now. Um, I come to this work um, from a, a professional background um, in um, higher education and um, some academic expertise and experience in um, religion and social change. So I did my, my master's and my PhD in religion and social change. Um, but kind of uh, zooming out from that, I, um, I'm originally from Kentucky, um, from a fairly conservative evangelical community um, is, is sort of what I was raised in and had opportunities to study and to travel in um, throughout high school. And then especially in, in college um, or at the end of, of college was really where I had more formative experiences that led me into this work. Um, so I, I spent time living in, in Egypt and um, traveling through Syria and Lebanon and Israel, Palestine, and um, had um, just some really transformative op, um, experiences in encountering people of my own faith tradition who looked and thought very differently than I did. And then of course, encountering people of um, primarily Jewish and Muslim um, faith traditions that really helped to sort of widen my, my view and um, you know, came back to the US um, excited to, <laughs> to tell uh, my family and friends back in Kentucky how wrong um, we had gotten <laughs> perspectives on people from the Middle East and, and Muslims in particular. And, um, you know, to my naive surprise, people were not just willing to, um, to hear <laughs> my experiences and sort of accept them. Um, but, but rather, I, you know, I came to, to realize um, sort, of, sort of the deep rooted um, 
perspectives um, within the community that I come from around around these issues, and um, it really led me into into this work. So first, um, from a more academic perspective, and then as I went on in that, really wanted to um, get more involved in in a more advocate and activist sort of way in this work, and um, that that sort of led me to shoulder to shoulder. So um, I'm grateful to be here and and to be working with with people like you across the country who I think are doing the real work on the ground in your communities. Thank you. Nina? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the program director at Shoulder to Shoulder. And, you know, much like Catherine said, you know, I have a, a history and a, and a passion for working on these issues, um, social justice issues, really, from a, a multi-faith lens. It's it's kind of my jam. It's it's what I studied um, in, in undergrad, as well as in my master's um, work. And, and I, for me, and personally, I come from a family where religion is, is deeply tied to culture. My mother taught us about our Sri Lankan identity and culture um, through religion. Uh, we're, we're raised Catholic. And, um, you know, that intersection uh, is, is core to who I am. And, and I know what it's like, you know, when, when uh, people would discriminate um, uh, against me because uh, of, of these different identities. And, and as people of faith and conscience, uh, you know, we, we can't stand um, an idol when, when people are discriminated against for, for who they are. And as I, you know, uh, am involved in this work, I see the, the role that faith communities and faith leaders um, can take on in fighting um, on this issue. Um, addressing anti-Muslim discrimination. And, and it's uh, a privilege to be able to work with leaders across the country, like all of you, um, who are doing this work on the ground at the grassroots level. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, let Cassandra introduce herself to you, um, uh, while I have deep respect for both of you, Catherine and Nina, uh, Cassandra holds a very special place in my heart. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge the work that you're doing, um, Cassandra, in, in public. So um, you know that many of us have spent um, much of the last two he years healing from um, incidents of sexual harassment that have um, impacted tri-faith and women. And Cassandra is um, not only an advocate for this conversation around the Muslim community and uh, Islamophobia, but for an advocate for women. Um, and I have so much respect for um, the spaces that you've invited me into as a leader and a friend and um, your passion for um, the interfaith movement, um, amplifying the voices of all women and um, standing up for justice. And so um, I don't know that we have a chance to celebrate you enough publicly, um, but I, um, with so much grace, am so grateful that you're my friend. So please tell us about how you're called to do the work. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, it's an honor and, and humbling to be in, in your space, in Tri-Faith space um, as a guest here with my, my colleagues and friends, Nina and Catherine. Um, yeah, I, for, for addressing uh, why I'm called to interfaith work is really because as a young adult, I, was, I grew up uh, middle class, um, liberal, <laughs> United Methodist, and um, in pretty much white suburbia. And the idea was that if everybody just gets, everybody should just get along, <laughs> it will be all right. There should be no conflict in the world. And uh, I quickly became aware that that was not true. Um, on a youth trip to Israel and Palestine, we visited, uh, led by our, um, my childhood pastor who was Jordanian, Palestinian, um, Christian. Uh, we visited all the holy sites and also visited um, Christian peacemakers teams and um, learned about the conflict there. And what I learned was what Nina was alluding to was the, the, the incredible tragedy of violence and injustice that sometimes divides us from each other, but then also the beauty of people standing in solidarity and protecting each other and creating sacred community. Um, 
And from that point on, like I didn't realize it at the time, of course, because I was 18, um, I had started committing my life to understanding the nuances of conflict and injustice that make us strangers to each other, but then also to understand the ways that we um, also cross those, those borders and create community together um, so that we can heal those wounds and uh, work together for the beloved community. And so that's really like what calls me um, anti-Muslim discrimination, particularly um, uh, as, as it relates to, to racism in our country. Um, but as Wendy alluded to with the sexual harassment and discrimination, interfaith work is, is sacred space to me. Um, it's my ministry. Um, in fact, this morning I found out that I have my interview for ordination, my next stage, <laughs> next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, and so I will continue that role, um, that process. But yeah, so thank you for this space and for all the work that you all do in modeling this sacred community. Thank you. So we have a special extra guest today also, Gary. Um, I want to invite you to, to tell a little bit about the work that you're doing with Shoulder to Shoulder. Um, and feel free to jump in on any of the questions as well after you've introduced yourself. Hi, um, I'm Gary Champlainer, and I am uh, a retired government lawyer. I have been in the Treasury Department for many years. Uh, prior to that, I had used to work on political asylum pro bono cases and got um, interested in that area of work. And I also am a member of a Jewish congregation in Bethesda, Maryland, that is uh, has cohabited with a church, Presbyterian church, for over 50 years and have been spending the last 20 plus years getting a Muslim congregation also involved with us. So I've I've read about Tri-Faith Initiative before and I'm very interested in learning more and maybe talking to you more about what you've been doing, what, what we've been doing. But for Shoulder to Shoulder, I've just been working as a uh, special consultant for advocacy, and in particular on a the No Ban Act, which I uh, hope some of you will know about, and Catherine will probably talk, or Nina will talk a little bit more about, uh, and uh, where we are trying, it, you know, we already succeeded, fortunately, with election President Biden in eliminating the Muslim ban that was the original um, reason for the No Ban Act, but the act itself is designed to assure as a matter of law, a statute that um, no president, Democratic or Republican, can impose a kind of discriminatory and uh, you know, religiously or nationally or otherwise arbitrary ban on uh, any group of people without satisfying certain criteria. So thanks, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this presentation. Thank you, and we're glad that you're here. So um, I, I understand that uh, you have talked a little bit ahead. I, I did give you some pre-questions, so I, I'm, I'm gonna pose the question and you all decide who uh, wants to pipe in to answer. Um, and please know that um, as audience, if you have questions along the way, feel free to start putting them in the chat and we'll try to get to those as well. Um, please share some history of Shoulder to Shoulder and um, some of the work that you've been working on um, over the last decade. Well, I can start on that and then um, my colleagues chime in where you where you like. Um, but Shoulder to Shoulder was founded um, a decade ago in 2010, um, in the fall of 2010, to um, respond really to the rising anti-Muslim um, rhetoric and acts of violence that were happening in the public square at that point. So um, many will recall the um, the controversies over the so-called Ground Zero Mosque in Manhattan. Um, there was also um, a series of, of um, vandalism and arson attacks on a mosque in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, right outside um, Nashville, which is actually where I now live. Um, and um, a pastor in Florida, Terry Jones, was threatening to publicly burn Qurans. Um, and all of this sort of was converging in the summer and, and fall of 2010. And a number of um, faith denominations at the national 
level um, already had existing relationships with the Islamic Society of North America and other national Muslim partners um, because they've been working together already on issues of poverty, on issues of hunger, on issues of foreign policy, all sorts of reasons um, that these communities were already in relationship. But when this was, was kind of bubbling up and, and happening, um, the, the Christian and Jewish faith denominations came to the Muslim organizations and said, what can we do besides just saying on our platforms that this is wrong and speaking out against it? What can we do collectively? And so they decided to pull together um, a, a huge um, multi-faith press conference with the senior leadership of over 40 different religious denominations, many of which did not typically stand together at press conferences. Um, so the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops was there standing alongside the Interfaith Alliance, standing alongside the American Baptists, um, the Southern Baptists, the National Association of Evangelicals, most of the Protestant groups, the Union for Reform Judaism, the list goes on and on, but it was, you know, sort of um, leadership of, of many of, of the major religious groups in the United States that jointly signed on to a letter and then held this press conference with um, lots and lots of, of news cameras in the room. Um, and the, the message was was fairly um, succinct. There were two parts to it. From our own faith traditions, um, this is wrong. Our own faith traditions teach us to, to speak out when this sort of thing is happening. Um, and also, this is not the way we want to see American ideals advanced. Um, if we want, um, we all want religious freedom for ourselves and our own communities. And if we want that, we need to be um, actively pursuing it for everyone in order for this to be the country that, that we all want to see. Um, so that was the, the birth of Shoulder to Shoulder. And from there, um, you know, there, there was a lot of work at the beginning around um, sort of coordinating this national level response. But pretty quickly after that, um, it became clear, I mean, to a couple of things. One, um, we all know that, that while faith, um, national sort of faith statements and, and press conferences are really important, um, they're not going to um, necessarily automatically trickle down and solve the issue. <laughs> it's really at the local communities um, that this deeper work, um, long-term sustainable sort of work needs to be done. And so early in the days of Shoulder to Shoulder, um, we, we expanded to, um, to being deeply involved in, in community work and trying to connect with um, the community groups across the country that are leading this work and had been already leading this work for so long and figure out the ways we as Shoulder to Shoulder can sort of connect them to each other and support and uplift the work that that they are doing um, in many ways. And so, so we organize our work into three sort of main buckets. Um, we equip faith communities and leaders um, to more effectively address this issue. So that typically happens through our trainings, our faith over fear trainings that we, we did in partnership with, with TriFaith um, back in 2019 when we could gather in person. And um, we also develop resources um, sometimes in response to what community groups that are part of our, our national network are asking for. Um, so we have over 60 um, community groups that are part of our community and congregational network that we work with and, and are in um, you know, active conversation with many of those and help to connect those folks to each other. Um, the second piece of our work is connecting, which includes that network building, as well as um, creating opportunities for people to connect with their neighbors. So um, we do a big campaign each year during Ramadan um, that has, of course, looked different during COVID, but we still are, are doing it. Um, and, and we can talk more about that a little later. Um, and then the third bucket of our work um, is is mobilizing. Um, so this is, you know, looks like our work on things like the, the No Ban Act that Gary just mentioned, um, really working to uplift faith voices. And, and um, you know, I mean, I think today was a really good example. Um, Tri-Faith um, Leadership met with um, uh, ben Sass's office um, about the Tri-Faith or about, sorry, about the No Ban Act, in part because we um, had had a meeting with his office and they said, well, we like it in theory, but we don't think our constituents care about it. And we said, we think they actually do. And so um, we're able to sort of translate that um, to and, and give local communities information. And sometimes it's us receiving information from local communities and trying to figure out ways that we can support locally led efforts. So we see this as sort of a back and forth process in many ways, but um, that's that's in general the the broad um, brush overview of, of what our work looks like. 
Thank you. Um, let's move on actually to the next question. Um, many of us have had the opportunity to be in relationship with members of the American um, uh, AMI as, as partners, but, but tell us a little bit more about the uh, uh, Muslim population in North America. And I, I know quite a bit has been um, done in looking at um, both the demographics of that, as well as um, some of the social policy and leanings of um, the Muslim population. And I know you have a good scope of that. So could you give us kind of a big overview of some of that information? It's gonna go first. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, d just to say first that that the American Muslim community are are anything but a monolith, and so uh, when we think about about this community, um, you know, specifically when you look at at the data and and some of the resources that our partners, for example, at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, um, have shared, um, um, this community is the most ethnically diverse faith community in America. Um, which is so amazing. And we don't hear um, enough about that diversity in the media um, and, and in other, in other platforms. And, and that's one of, of the many, the many uh, pieces of information that we, we want to share, um, the, di the diversity of the American Muslim community. Um, and, and, you know, um, other kind of uh, aspects, uh, most Muslims have been here since the founding of America, for example. Um, uh, since uh, the country's inception, as, as many Muslims were brought over as, as slaves and were enslaved, um, uh, there, there as well it has been, um, uh, you know, immigration is, is very much a part of the Muslim story, um, but it's, it's also very much a part of the American um, uh, founding. Um, those are some, some big, big points. Um, Catherine, Cassandra, are there any other that you'd like to share? Um, I can just jump jump in to add that um, one of the um, uh, data points that sort of came out from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding's American Muslim Poll this this last time was um, that um, Muslims are are the youngest faith community in the United States in terms of demographics of, of membership of the community um, and as Nina said that the most ethnically diverse um, and about a quarter of Muslims are African American and so when um, issues like um, Black Lives Matter um, are coming up it's it's not um, I mean certainly Certainly, they're intersectional issues in many ways, but they're, you know, actually um, embodied intersectional issues for for many um, for a quarter of American Muslims. And so, I think that's an important thing to understand. Another thing that came out in the in the last. Um, poll, and I'll stop at this, but um, is that, you know, the issues that American Muslims care about are very similar to the issues that Americans of other faith backgrounds care about. So they talk about health care, they talk about education, um, all sorts of, of social policy type issues that are the same concerns um, of of every other American. And so um, we see them in many ways as, you know, a unique faith community, but in, in many other ways, um, looking very similar to um, Jewish and, and Christian populations in the US as well. Thank you. Cassandra, anything to add? Okay. Um, so you've, you've touched a bit on what the mission of Shoulder to Shoulder does and kind of the, the buckets of the how you're addre addressing that. But I'm wondering, um, I, I think we'd like to know a little bit more about um, some of your training in particular, the, the, the Faith Over Fear training, um, if you could tell about some of your partners on that. And um, it really is a unique um, way to use you know media and research and and such that you've couched your training in can you can you tell us a little bit more about both the why and the how of of some of your training sure so so there are kind of three core components of our training um the first is understanding the problem of islamophobia and anti-muslim bigotry in america um, and what that looks like it's a it's a multi-million dollar industry um, um, going into misinformation and and discrimination discrimination um, there you know it, it is intersecting with so many different issues um, there's gendered islamophobia anti-black racism um, uh, as it connects to, to foreign policy as well as domestic policy um, you know it's 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 a very intersectional 
and an intense issue. Um, and so we, we really spend a lot of time in the first part of our training diving into the problem so folks can understand um, what is it that we're trying to address? What is it that we're trying to take on? Um, and, and how can we begin um, on this issue, this very complex issue? Um, the second part of the training is messaging and communications. Uh, so how do we talk about this um, in a one-to-one -one level as well as publicly, whether that be um, in our, in our um, uh, writing, in our sermons or um, uh, public talks? Um, how do we not, uh, for example, example, reinforce negative stereotypes? Um, how do we lead to change people on this issue uh, with not just skewing out facts and data that doesn't always convince people, um, but rather move them along a journey um, uh, of transformation and, and slowly, one step at a time, one conversation at a time, um, and, 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 and kind of make change on the messaging front. Um, and then the third component is strategies. Um, what can we do? What kind of programs can we implement? Um, what are some creative ways to, again, bring people along um, on a journey uh, of transformation and making change on this, again, very complex issue? So, so that's a bit um, about our training, um, but really in terms of the many ways that Shoulder to Shoulder wants to address this issue, you know, we want to provide opportunities as well as uplift opportunities that, that, that um, groups like you all are, are coordinating um, uh, to connect connect with folks, get to know your, your neighbors. Um, as simple as building relationships, it, it can be quite profound in making change on this issue, um, humanizing the issue, especially when uh, the goal of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry is to dehumanize a group of people. Um, and so um, providing opportunities to connect with each other, we, we do a Ramadan campaign um, every year where we either uplift, but pre-pandemic, we, we uplifted um, interfaith iftars or iftars open to interfaith guests. And we'll share more about that um, later on as we, we talk. Um, but again, like thinking about ways that we can get to know each other. Um, and then, you know, we, we want to be, um, you know, accompany people um, along in this process. Be, be thought partners, um, be supportive um, in, in whatever way that we can, whether it be pointing to resources that already exist or creating and, and generating new resources um, that are relevant to you all. So that's a little bit about, about what we do. And, and so I, I, I'm going to ask just the, the next question because what um, I'm a, a communication uh, nerd. And I, you know, really thought the messaging part of of the faith over fear, and 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 granted, faith over fear was two full days. So I, I get that I'm I'm not asking you to to jump into the whole thing here, but um, can you go a little bit deeper into the what are some of the messages that work, and how did you come about finding out what those messages um, are? And and what suggestions do you have? And some of those were messages for. Like or tri faith has has absolutely um, used some of the messaging that we learned from that training. But how can the people here on this call um, use the that toolkit moving forward? Oh, oh go ahead, Nina. If you yeah. want to, no, go ahead, Catherine. Go ahead. Both of you. I'll I'll start with um, that. You know, one of the really key things is is figuring out ways to connect on shared values. So um, we talk about this in a number of different ways, like expanding the circle immediately, like getting inside the circle with the people you're talking with. But um, really, this kind of goes um, hones in on finding um, somewhere where you do have shared values in this space and starting the conversation from there, um, rather than trying to convince people about something they know nothing about. And so um, we we partnered with an um, organization called Rethink Media um, for developing this training, and they do all sorts of messaging, research, and polling um, on issues related to this. And one of the things that they they did um, a couple years ago, and they've, they've kind of redone this a, a couple times and keep finding the same thing um, is that with um, as so the sort of middle audience of America, what they call the movable middle. So, um, you know, this this big sort of they have a, um, diagrams that they show us and it's this whole bell in the middle of America resonates with with messages around three major things around freedom of religion, 
um, people on the left and right um, and anywhere in between agree that they want freedom of religion. Um, they may disagree on how we define that when we get into um, sort of the details, um, but, but everyone agrees with this idea that freedom of religion should be accessible and available to everyone in the United States. The second message that, um, that people resonate with um, so much is, is that no one in this country should fear for their safety because of how they look or how they pray. Um, and that's something that really resonates with people across the board. Um, and then the third message that um, that resonates with people is this idea of, of the United States being um, like this united we stand, divided we fall sort of messaging um, that we need to come together when, when we're in times of crisis and that, that we are stronger when we come together. Um, and so those are, those are three messages that can be, um, uh, you know, we can start with, we can start many conversations on this issue with those three messages um, in order to get people sort of in the door and instead of trying to immediately out the door tell them Islam is a religion of peace. That may be true. That is true. <laughs> and yet, um, if somebody knows nothing about Islam um, and, and only knows things um, by watching the news, um, that's not a message that they can immediately sort of resonate with. So, so the idea is finding a value that, that people already resonate with um, and then asking them to apply it in a new situation, in a new way that they hadn't necessarily done before. Um, another piece of, of the, the messaging and communications training is really around um, beyond those shared values, finding ways to tell stories, um, to tell personal and humanizing stories about American Muslims that help um, to, to sort of break stereotypes um, and, and those sorts of things. And it's, it's sort of after this, um, after you've gotten in the door, after you've humanized this issue a little bit that you can talk um, facts and data <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, but, it, but you have to kind of get in that door first. Um, Nina, Cassandra, what else would you all add? I think one, one of the things that I love about how Shoulder to Shoulder does this work and how Catherine really talks about it is um, that as an organization, we have lots of different people come, come, come forward and, and reach out to us seeking help on this issue. Um, and our goal is to walk with them from their own context and values. And so that you know, we might have um, reform or conservative uh, synagogues and Jewish communities come to us or progressive and then conservative uh, Christian communities come to us, but that the goal is to find out what are your core values that are compelling you to, to, to see this issue as something that needs to be addressed. And then that is like what connects you with the people immediately around you. So how do we talk about anti-Muslim discrimination and violence when there's no Muslims in the room? Because that's when it happens most of the time. Or when you think that there's no Muslims in the room, because as Nina pointed out, the Muslim community is so diverse that we could, you know, you just don't always know because of that racialized lens we have of who Muslims are. Um, and so that one of the, the other things that Catherine is always saying is like how relationships aren't necessarily like the only thing that's going to solve these issues, but they're the, they're the thing that's going to help us make it possible for us to know each other, to know what the issues are, to know what those common values are, and to then form trust and build trust so that we can work together to um, build better communities and to build communities like yourselves and others. Um, around the values of building that those three values of freedom of religion, being fear, free of fear, um, and then also um, being united as a community. Thank you. Nina, anything else to add there? Um, I just want to say, I think I think it's important to note that that core to shoulder to shoulders wor work and, and our approach, our ethos is that this issue is Islamophobia and anti-Muslim discrimination and all of its intersections is not just a Muslim issue. You know, it is the task and it is the work of all each and every one of us um, to, to address, to dismantle from our unique positions. Um, and, and each of us are, are powerful change agents in the circles that we operate in. Um, and, and we all are, are intersectional in our identities and, and can speak to this issue from a unique space. Um, and so what we're trying to do really is, is equip 
uh, leaders from, from wherever they are positioned to be strong uh, messengers, um, change agents um, uh, on this issue, because it is, it is the work of all of us. And, and much like any issue, um, um, you know, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, all the different um, um, issues that we address, it's not the work uh, of, uh, of just the impacted community. Um, and actually it's more so the responsibility uh, of, of those of us who are not um, in, in those communities. Thank you. Gary, it looks like you unmuted yourself. Is that my sign to say that you have something to share? Uh, no, totally unintentional. This is more, far more their show than mine. <laughs> it's, all, it's all of our show. We're all, we all ought to show up for each other. So um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you then. So a um, lot, of, lot of questions in the chat around um, how are we going to partner together and particularly to address um, uh, getting this message to uh, a younger crowd. Um, I'm curious to know what your immediate thoughts are in terms of, you know, one of the things that we have found in our early conversations on this topic is um, being up against the, the state standards for uh, social studies um, and, and teaching for the test and also getting um, approval of, of curriculum kind of through the system. Um, in, in addition to know that religion is often taught through the lens of war, as opposed to um, increasing cultural competence. So I'm, I'm curious, um, any wins that you've had in terms of starting to develop curriculum for a younger audience and um, any suggestions again, towards the idea of mobilizing um, to get those into schools across different um, sectors as Sharon was asking about. Um, um, thoughts on that topic? Well, um, we, we are in conversation um, with, with folks, including TriFaith, um, as well as um, particularly some leaders in South Dakota um, who want to be able to put together a, a, a training uh, specifically for educators and, and how um, this impacts um, uh, their classroom, um, how, to, how to talk about it, how to address it. Um, and, and so we are working to do that. Um, and that's just one uh, step along the way. Um, another piece that, that we're um, excited to share about that, that is um, another angle or approach is um, we're, we're doing a shoulder to shoulder interfaith photo voice experience. Um, this coming Ramadan, and we hope to, to do it uh, multiple times. Um, and this is for um, this, this particular iteration will be for a young adult um, audience, but we also want to, to offer it for youth as well, um, as well as, as for, for all of us. But um, it's, it's, it's the use of, of our smartphones or, or uh, camera phone um, and, and, and being able to um, uh, share our photographs with one another and, and kind of go deep um, into uh, kind of building uh, awareness about our identities and our experiences um, and, and then move along into empathy, into social change and action together. And, and so um, we are just opened um, applications for this first round, especially as um, the holy days and in, in, in many of our traditions converge um, this month and next month. Um, and so um, that is just one, um, again, a, a different approach to, to bringing in youth and young adults um, into, this, into this work. And can I add that um, one of the thoughts on on kind of us starting with with educators um, instead of immediately for us, this is kind of a, a step before diving into trying to um, impact curriculum itself. Um, we work with some partners who are working more on the curriculum front, but as you mentioned, Wendy, it's it's um, a very challenging challenging space um, with different state standards and all of those sorts of things. And so, you know, coming alongside other organizations that are doing that, but um, but being able to um, work directly with, with educators, um, I think is really important in addressing this um, at the youth level in part because some um, reports tell us that um, in 
Muslim students who experience bullying, um, about 50% of them reported, um, or it, it may be even more than 50% of them that reported that actually the bullying came from the teachers. And so thinking about um, the the role of um, of this in in kind of you know first addressing the teachers because you um, and I think Cassandra has has pointed this out numerous times that you can't put um, solid curriculum in people's hands if that teacher is not going to teach it according to the curriculum. And so um, really working with, um, with educators as, as sort of a first level approach for us. Um, and we saw this in we, a couple years ago in Michigan, we did a faith over fear training in a number of, of um, educators and, and people involved in the school board in the town that we were in came to the training um, and, and you know said that it's something they would really like to take back to, um, to the school board and to, to educators in their community. So, so it's an exploratory area for us. It's, it's an area we have not um, we don't have a, a huge track record in this. It's it's something we're um, developing, but we were excited to hear that TriFaith is also um, thinking in that direction. And, and it seems that there are some great opportunities for us to work together in this. And I'm curious if you could expand maybe even a little bit further and, and not only in, in the lens of, of education, but um, clearly as uh, we we were responding to the death of, of George Floyd and, and the the movement for diversity, equity, inclusion, um, very much framed around the topic of race. Where do you see this intersection of race and religion being particularly um, Im important in the in the conversation around Islamophobia and in in the Muslim community? Yeah, um, I might. I'll, I'll start us off, and then we can all like keep continuing. Um, it's important, like, and, and we had Todd Green, Reverend Todd Green, um, Reverend Dr. Todd Green um, at TriFaith with us when we were there. And one of the things that he points out that many people are calling towards is that uh, anti-Muslim discrimination and violence is intimately connected to how our country and our community, country's culture has racialized difference. And so that we, um, that what is happening to American Muslims today is part of a long history of racism and how um, discrimination and oppression has happened in this country. And so, I mean, even if we count in like the, the attack on Tuesday night um, of, the, of the massage parlors in Atlanta, the Asian massa massage parlors, um, that that is a part also of like with the Asian Exclusion Act um, in, the eight, in the 1800s, um, that these pieces are about how um, American identity has been wrapped up in what whiteness is and in Christianity. And so that in that wrapping, there is this weird um, duality that happens that assigns people that are not white Christians as being non-American, one, and then two, it, um, it both demonizes and dehumanizes others, but then it also like vilifies them. So there, there's both like this afraidness of, of, of like non-white communities, as well as a um, like a, a diminishing of it. And so that like anti-Muslim discrimination, like we, Nina has talked about this and we've talked about this about how diverse the Muslim community is, but within the American framework, we only ever see it as people from the Middle East. Um, and that is a part of the racialized racism that happens in white supremacy that makes all Muslims a particular identity um, and tries to erase the diversity because in erasing the diversity, there's, there's an attempt to continue to keep us separated from each other. And so like, um, so yeah, I just wanna like, that is a part of the work of like how um, racism has worked to racialize our religious differences as well as to keep us separated from each other. And so that's to me why one of the important reasons of doing like interfaith and interracial work is like to purposefully, um, question those narratives that keep us separated um, and keep us afraid of each other. And that's why like, it's my responsibility as like a white Christian woman to be like, hey, and especially now going into clergy, like 
this is our work to do because this is something that my community has helped to perpetuate and continue. Thank you, Paul. I, I see that you've um, offered some thoughts, but maybe you could turn your mic and video on and, and share a little bit um, of understanding in terms of how you're seeing this education work in the Omaha area and, and your partnership with uh, educators. It's a long story, uh, Wendy. <laughs> I'm not sure which pieces of it you would like me to address. I was just I was just responding to uh, Sharon's observation that high schools do teach world religions, and uh, we have been working with high school instructors for now I believe 12 to 14 years uh, to to try to support them and ensure that the curriculum that they're teaching is based on uh, proper scholarship rather than frankly, on this or that religious perspective, often we, we find that we have a choice between, uh, there are many religious organizations that want to teach world religions in the public schools, but they have theological agendas that are not necessarily uh, providing the best perspective and often feeding into many of the stereotypes. So uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, instructors that are interested in teaching world religions get support and get some kind of uh, opportunity to work with each other. I'm particularly happy that uh, the principal figure that I've been working with for most of this time is Gary Groff, who has worked with a lot of uh, the local religious communities, uh, Hindu temple, he's familiar with tri-faith, he's familiar with a wide range of the synagogues and churches and has done an excellent job of trying to get high school students from central high school to, to uh, understand uh, what religious diversity ha it has to offer in terms of value to our society. And uh, so that's just a piece of it, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions as well. Thank you. For, for those who are not aware, Paul is the head of the Religious Studies Department at UNO and um, on the Tri-Faith Board. Um, and uh, actually um, to the shoulder to shoulder team, he'll be on our call um, that we have scheduled um, in April um, to talk about partnerships, Rabbi. Um, I have, uh, if I can move the subject, uh, both uh, Catherine and uh, Cassandra spoke about some uh, involvement um, in the Palestine-Israel relationship. So this is something very um, interesting about the tri-faith. Uh, for uh, the last uh, 14 years, uh, I am trying to gently move to having a conversation. Uh, you can hear from my accent that I'm a kid of the Middle East. Uh, I was born in Israel. But to my great surprise, uh, there is a resistance on the part of the stakeholders in the tri-faith um, to uh, deal with a question that I think it's essential to bring up, which is the relationship between uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, and sometimes the fear uh, is coming from, God forbid, uh, we should uh, do something for the well-being of what we created. And I think that uh, there is fear about bringing this topic or the surface. I don't, I'm not afraid of it. I think it's necessary. And I think sooner or later, we'll have to discuss this issue. So in your experience, can you tell, tell us how would you suggest to delve into uh, this issue of relationship between Jews and Palestinians? Just, just on one foot quickly, I'm sure you can, go after that, right? I mean, it's it's a challenge in every community that we work in and in our, our national circles as well. Um, it's, 
I, I mean, I think that, you know, organizations take different sorts of approaches to when and how to raise that issue because it's so, um, it's, it's so emotionally charged for so many people and, and, um, you know, within both the Jewish and Muslim community and the diversity of opinions and approaches um, within both Jewish and Muslim communities um, certainly makes it um, a, a complex um, issue to, to address. I think we've, we've seen communities doing it well um, in, in kind of doing it over time, <laughs> you know, sort of slow um, uh, listening sort of steps to, to being able to hear each other um, on, on what this issue even means <laughs> to them and, and how they're connected to it, um, whether they have, you know, as, as you do, roots in the Middle East, um, or it's connected through um, through other sort of symbolic ways to to their um, identity, and so um, so it's certainly one that that I think is you know important to be thinking about um, ways of approaching it and and um, you know taking steps depending on on the organization sort of approach um, into it, um, but but with um, a lot of a lot of intention and care, um, because I think it we have also seen it very quickly um, uh, spiral communities into into um, you know deep spaces of, of frustration and, and lack of ability to to converse with one another as well if it's not taken on on very intentionally and with a lot of care. So I don't know that I have um, a, you know especially some tips. I learned a lot uh, there, but I was in a you know very much in a learning mode um, and um, you know. I've, I've actually facilitated, helped facilitate some conversations on, I used to work on University of Denver's campus and, and did a lot of work between um, some student groups around some issues that came up. Um, and it was, it was challenging. I learned a lot, but I don't know that I have, a, I don't know if anybody has, um, you know, here, here are the steps to make sure that conversation goes well, because it's, it's very challenging in so many spaces. I, I want to add something just, you know, advice from our own trainings and that that may or may not um, apply here but but you know on this issue uh, um, among many issues but uh, particularly this issue it's so easy to talk about it as an us and them issue um, and and it's very divisive um, um, and and so you know what we start with in in our trainings is is what are our shared identities what makes us us um, you know, perhaps we are, we come together as, as mothers and fathers, as uh, people who really love this sports team or, you know, this food or this, um, you know, whatever it is that, that brings us together and, and, and puts us in the same circle rather than two separate circles. Um, and so th that's a great way to start um, with having difficult conversations, I'd say. I yeah, it feels like it's so important to have that those relationships of trust established, well established, um, in order to to get there. And and I think it's important to dive into difficult conversations, especially ones that are sort of the elephants in the room often, um, and that that has to be done in in spaces where there is already trust and um, care for the people know you you love them as a person in order to be able to to have an honest conversation. So. Thank you. I am, am just reading uh, Adam Grant's new book that's called Think Again, and it's about um, acknowledging what you don't know. And one of the statements that I really appreciated that I think speaks to this conversation is that we often talk about perspective taking, but perhaps we should rethink that lens to perspective think seeking. And so how, how are we seeking to understand um, the person who is seeing um, the conversation through a lens other than our own. Um, and uh, my, my good friend, I wish, Brene Brown often says, you know, help me to understand why you feel so passionately about um, how you feel. So I, I think, uh, Rabbi, we are, we are getting closer um, to be able to have difficult conversations on a host of um, topics, including that one, In, and, and um, modeling again for the world that we can agree to disagree also that 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 we aren't always going to see everything um, 
the same way and that we can honor in the same way that we honor that our religions um, have beautiful things that are similar. We really value that we have things that are different. Um, on that, I, I would love just to take, we have five minutes left and, and we promised we'd at least touch on Ramadan coming. Um, so the the holiday is uh, begins, I believe on uh, the, the 12th, is that right, of, of April? Um, um, uh, right, right, depending, right? Um, so a, a quick, you know, for those of us who are here who do not celebrate, what are some um, tips that we might offer um, to those in our community who do? Um, and thoughts, um, particularly around the concept of mobilize that we, and, and perhaps something related to the, the No Ban Act that we can do proactively during the month of Ramadan to support um, in lots of ways um, our neighbors. Would like to go first. Go ahead, Nina. Yeah, I can't remember which one. Which one of us? Um. So, so yes, Ramadan is coming up. Um. As um, some of you may know, it's a it's a time of fasting, of prayer, of gathering with family and friends, and of course that looks different um, given that we are still in the pandemic. Um, and, and so um, one of the ways that that shoulder to shoulder has been, um, um, you know using Ramadan as an opportunity to connect folks um, is, is through our Ramadan campaign that we are doing again this year called Welcome to My Table. And uh, this is an opportunity to, to pair households with one another to, to share a meal um, and get to know each other. Um, and, and so we welcome um, all of you to be a part of that if you'd like to be paired um, with a household and, and, and celebrate either celebrate um, over an iftar meal, uh, which is the, the fast breaking meal um, during Ramadan um, with another family or, or connect before or after. Um, as uh, a way to build relationships with folks around the country. Um, we also have resources. Um, uh, we, we went on a Ramadan road trip in 2019 and visited some of these iftars um, in, in the American Southeast um, to, to show the diversity of the American Muslim um, community as well as to, to tell stories from these gatherings and created this video series with accompanying discussion guides um, that we welcome um, folks to use and view and, and, and connect with each other and, 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 and share. Um, and so that, that those are some opportunities um, that we have coming up as well as the Interfaith Photo Voice Project um, for young adults um, that um, we hope folks will, will, will use as an opportunity to, to come together. Um, and then, you know, wanna pass it to Gary to talk about the No Ban Act and what we all can be doing now. Sure. Uh, I, I, I would say this, that I don't think that the, um, I, at least I can't think of a particular significance in, um, that, that Ramadan attaches to the No Ban Act, but I do think that, generally speaking, that um, at least on the Hill, that, that Congress people accept that Muslims are very, uh, feel strongly about it, and they don't in a way don't even need to know that, but what they do need to know, I think, is that that non-Muslims feel strongly about it and that non-Muslims can see how what was done by the Trump administration could be done, and at least in the old days was done to Mormons, and uh, at least that's the one example of a religious immigration discrimination I've heard of, but um, generally, you know, could be done to, uh, who knows, fundamentalist Christians someday or, or some other group. So to the extent that that Jews and Christians can support uh, you know, send something to Senator Sass right now is he, he's a, a critical one that we're really looking to uh, try to convince, but uh, other people just to, to let them know that this is not just a Muslim issue and it, it is something of concern to the faith community at large. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for all being here today. We did put a few of the resources in the chat. Um, go ahead and grab them. I'll send them out um, with the follow-up and the, the recording of this to share with friends uh, who weren't able to see it today. I also did put in the chat um, a program evaluation. We'd love your feedback and suggestions on what you think is working and not working about this series. And um, with that, I'll thank you 
to my friends for joining us today. And we're looking forward to um, continuing to deepen our relationship with each other. And um, the same true for all the faces on the screen here today. Thank you so much for being here and I hope you enjoy the sunshine. Thank you, so nice to meet, to meet